Well, you know where we are. We are in the study of principles of Christian ethics, and we've looked at three of them thus far, faith, love, the Holy Spirit, and we're on this fourth one of liberty, that the Christian must realize that he is totally free, he has complete liberty in the Lord Jesus. We've spent a lot of time looking at it thus far. And we got down to some statements from the negative side of Christian liberty. In the first place, our liberty is not to sin. Mm -hmm. And secondly, our liberty is not to cause others any harm. And I said there would be two points under this. And we're coming to the second one. We spent two or three or so messages there on the first one. And that is that our liberty in not causing any harm to others is not for the purpose of causing another brother or another sister to stumble. And so we did a big discussion of the stronger one versus the weaker one. Now, you don't have to write all of this unless you just want to because we've given it. But I want to say these statements over again. Uh, because a lot of people do get confused in liberty and, and they see maybe a principle in liberty that the strong have to watch out for the weak and so you know that this happens many times they end up really compromising the word it's not that we're talking about some area of conscience or some area of indifference they really end up compromising the word so we raise the question under this point how far should we take this liberty business this business of not causing our brother to stumble. This topic of the stronger one watching out for the weaker one. We gave you three distinctions to remember. In the first place, a distinction has to be made between things of substance and things that are inconsequential. Things that are of substance, no compromise, no stepping away, no backing down, no hiding your light under a bushel can be made in an area where we're talking about the Word of God, the clear teaching of the Word of God. JDS, for example, you can't just say, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, so let's keep peace. No. That's not a thing inconsequential. That is a thing consequential. So you can't back down and say, well, they're weaker and we're stronger, so we'll just agree together. In the second place, a distinction has to be made between one who is genuinely offended someone who's really generally we're talking about someone almost always new in the faith and who just has a tender tender weak conscience about various things they've done in the world and now they don't want to get too close to that and maybe they see you getting a little too close to that and they become genuinely offended a distinction between them and one who should know better and therefore rather than needing your understanding of their weakness their immaturity they need your rebuke is what they need. That's Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. Peter wasn't genuinely offended in this case in Galatians 2. He was one who knew better and needed rebuke, and he got it from the Apostle Paul. And thirdly, between one who's genuinely offended and, have you ever heard of one like this, one who always pleads weak conscience, weak conscience concerning just about everything, just because he doesn't want to have to do it. <laughs> you know, you'll start teaching something, oh, I'm, I'm weak, I don't think I could do that, I'm weak. Anything he doesn't want to do, he says, I'm weak about. He probably he's not even saved is his problem, but it could be someone who's a genuine brother. But they're really not very honest, and they're not going anywhere with God, that's for sure. If they're always playing weak conscience, weak conscience, every time you get to something difficult, they don't want to have to do so those were the three distinctions that we'd given you before, and we gave you this important note, a note that many people fail to remember, is that the weak brother must also <laughs> recognize the principle of Christian liberty so that he will not offend or criticize the strong one. Most of the emphasis in Paul's writing in the epistles of the New Testament is for the initiative of reconciliation and peace to be taken by the strong one because sometimes a weak one has no option he has no strength he's not able to but there are times where we find a reference such as 1st Corinthians 10 and verse 30 where Paul says now let's just keep a balance about these things 
You weak ones, we're not going to, we strong aren't just going to always condescend to you weak ones. You weak ones, keep in mind that some of us are strong. And if you see us doing things, then don't be an evil speaker of us because you think we've done something wrong. Don't let that offend you. Don't criticize us. You don't have to follow me in that if you're not up to that level. But just like I'm not supposed to criticize you in areas of adiaphora, where you haven't come to a place of my maturity, likewise, you're not supposed to criticize me either. And this is found, 1 Corinthians 10.30. Chapter 10 is talking about eating meat. Paul said, if I by grace be a partaker, partaker of the meat. He said, I can do it by, by thanksgiving, which is what he writes in 1 Timothy 4, that every creature of God is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. He said, then why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? By who? By a weak brother. That's what these chapters are about. Not about unbelievers. Not by unbelievers, but by a weak brother. That's what chapters 8, 9, and 10 are all about. He said, why am I evil spoken of? He said, I'm not saying that. And he even said back in chapter 8, he said, if meat makes my brother to offend, then I'll not eat meat as long as this age remains. And of course, we explain that. He doesn't mean the same person there. You can't be weak all of your life. The Bible never teaches that. But if there are people around, if he's in a place, you know, if you're in a city where you've got lots of people that are just converted, then it may go on and on indefinitely that you're going to have not the same person, but someone around you who's weak. So he said, I won't eat meat offered to idols as long as the world lasts if I have to do that. But he comes now and says, now, wait a minute. So I, I've condescended to your level. I've said that I'm not going to criticize you. I'm not going to try to lead you into my areas of strength because with you not being strong, it might defile your conscience. But he said, now, don't you criticize me. The whole emphasis is let's have peace and love, whether we're strong or whether we're weak. Furthermore, we said that the Christian, this is just review, but listen to these statements again. The Christian <clears throat> must waive the use of his Christian liberty unless the truth of the gospel is periled. Unless and until the stake is the truth of the gospel itself. Then Christian liberty is not the issue, but rather the doctrines of Scripture. What you can and can't wear is not a doctrine of Scripture, you see. That's Christian liberty. But when it comes to a doctrine of the Scripture, then Christian liberty is ceases to be the issue and did you remember me saying this that when some weak soul in the church a weak brother or sister insists that his heir be acknowledged as the truth then at that point he ceases to be a weak brother and he becomes a false teacher it's fine if he wants to have that as his doctrine for right now but have it unto yourself before God as soon as you bring us some little weak thought of yours that is an erroneous one and you insist that that be acknowledged as the truth of the gospel and you're insisting then you're not just a weak brother who genuinely has been offended about something you have adopted some false pet doctrine and at that point you become a false teacher now we gave you many examples of these things um, that I had written down on the side of my notes to remember to say. And I think one would fit in right here. Faith Assembly's teaching of sodomite shoes. When they insist that that be accepted as the truth of the gospel, at that point, whoever taught that becomes a false teacher and the church becomes a false church. Now, if you didn't put all those pieces together, you know I said that anyway, in essence, last time. The last teaching that we had, whenever a weak brother insist that his heir you see if you want to have that it's fine be quiet about it the things were to shout from the housetops are what are written right here in this book Hallelujah. it's not written in this book it's just some idea that you have Amen. and it's fine if you want to have that idea for right now but when you insist that i have that idea and it's not an idea based on the word of god you cease just to be a weak brother oh you offended me brother ross because of your statements about sodomite shoes because i used to be a homosexual and I just, I'm real tender in that area. Well, I would never wear them as long as the earth stands around you. 
But we're not talking about people like that. We're talking about people who just picked that up and made it into a doctrine and insist that we accept that as part of end time truth, as part of the revelation of the word of God. At that point, you're not, you cease to be a weak brother. Of course, that, at that point, you never were a weak brother. You were just someone who got a weak doctrine, which is a false one, and insisted that we acknowledge it as the truth. At that point, the word of God says, the apostle Paul teaches that is no longer a weak brother. That is a false doctrine. That is a false teacher. That is a false church. That is a false group of people. At that point, when you've adopted that, so we don't hesitate on saying, we have to say what the truth is about this. And any of these things, anything in this church, anything in any church where you picked up something that's not in the word of God, and you make that out to be something in the word of God, you're not just a weak brother that we offend because of uh, sodomite shoes or prostitute purses. You cease to be a weak brother and become a false teacher at that point. And so that's one of the things that we make a distinction on. We don't just keep on going, well, it's okay, it's okay anyway. It's okay as long as you don't want to force that doctrine on others. And secondly, it's okay as long as you don't hold that over six months or a year. You know, it's good to have, and if you're a strong one, you can do this. You can prove whether or not you're a strong one by checking yourself in this area, whether it really bothers you. Someone has a false little idea, but they've only been saved a couple of months. If that bothers you, you're weak like they are. That's one way to tell. I know these things just don't bother me as long as it's only for the first six months or a year or so. After that, it starts bothering me because you're no longer a weak brother. You're probably no brother or a false teacher at this point because you have not gotten the truth of that, assuming that you've been taught about that. If you just read your Bible, you're going to be liberated in areas of, of legalism that so many people seem to be caught up into. We said that a distinction has to be made between offense given and offense taken. Remember what happened in Matthew 15, whenever the disciples of Jesus ate with unwashed hands? Was offense given in that account? No, offense was taken by the religious leaders. They said, and the disciples on more than one occasion said to Jesus, don't you know you offended them? Well, it really was an offense given. It was offense taken by the false leaders because of false doctrine. In areas like that, we said there's nothing you can do. You can't help that. You just want to make sure that you don't go out of your way to provide an offense to someone. If you're teaching strong on divine healing and you've got a nurse in the audience out there, she's taking offense, you're not giving. It. But when you get into these little petty areas and start preaching that as doctrine, then you're giving an offense. You're giving a stumbling block. You're putting something out there for someone to stumble over. Medical science, going to doctors, not going to them, is not in the same category, you see, as whether you eat meat sacrificed to idols or not. They're two different categories. One is audio four, it doesn't make any difference. One, it makes all the difference in the world. One's based on the atonement, the other one, you can eat meat, not eat meat, eat vegetables, not eat vegetables, it's no big deal. Okay, I think we covered that thoroughly enough. Now let's come to uh, the second point under this second statement. Our liberty is not to harm others. The first place we said it's not to cause a brother to stumble. In the second place, we should not bring the reproach of unbelievers upon the church via our practices and principles of Christian liberty. The Old Testament teaches don't dig a ditch before the blind man. Don't put something out there in the area of Christian liberty, and we've given you various examples. We've given you the chief ones in the New Testament, notably circumcision, wine, and eating meat, particularly sacrifice to idols. Those are the three chief ones. We've given you others, sodomite shoes, makeup, dresses, pants, hairdos, the clothes that you wear, uh, having toys with occult symbols on them, eating candy from the holidays, all of these areas that make no difference at all. Remember what we taught on that? Are you free in that area? You could have a thing in your home with a witch drawn on it, and a witch is nothing. It's nothing at all. It's what Paul's talking about, meat offered to idols here. And I hope you're to the place that you could have that, and it affects you in no way at all. Witch is nothing. There's no God but one God. That's what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 8. 
but that does not mean you use your liberty and have occult signs around your home. It could cause a brother to stumble, one who's weak. Or it could, in this area, bring the reproach of unbelievers because they have occult signs around their home too. Well, then where's the distinction here? You're confusing them about your religion when they see nothing different between them and yourself. Now, you cannot make doctrines out of these things. That is the important. As soon as you make doctrines out of these things, you're missing the point. So, if you'll turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Peter 2 and verse 12 with Matthew 5.16. Peter says, having your life honest among the Gentiles, <clears throat> that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, we'll see this again uh, in the next chapter in his book here in a moment, uh, they speak against you as evildoers. He's not saying that they are evildoers. But I've had you know, people criticize me because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God because I believe in going to church, because I believe in reading my Bible. All you do is just read your Bible. and Well, they speak against you as evildoers. He didn't say that you are. They may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Hallelujah. So that you're no reproach to unbelievers around. And in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> so our liberty is never to cause reproach from unbelievers. 1 Peter 3.16 1 Peter 3.16 Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good life in Christ. It's all false accusation. Then he says in chapter 4 in verse 15 <clears throat> that if you suffer, then don't suffer as an evildoer. And he lists evil deeds there. Titus 3 in verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful. You have to be very, very careful with your life, where you are, and the people that you're around. To maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And then a verse that particularly it would apply to someone like myself would be 1st Peter or 1st Timothy 3 and verse 7 we've just seen it though in 1st Peter that it applies to all of us but it just happens to be brought out here in particular for a pastor 1st Timothy 3 7 and look at this moreover he must have a good report of them that are without probably he means without the faith without the church now, he doesn't mean like some people interpret this, well, I'm good friends with this political contributor and I'm good friends. No, that's not a good report. But to have a good report, you can't be teaching and you can't yourself, if we're talking about you, be living in an area and those that are without know that, well, you know, he owes me money. He never paid his debts. He cheats. He lies. He does all these things evil against me. I'm without the faith. I'm an unbeliever. Well, you're gonna, what's going to happen? You're going to bring reproach on the church and Christianity. He must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. So in these areas of liberty, we've enlightened you to many areas where you do have liberty. Uh, in short, in all areas, you have liberty. We haven't covered every aspect of that, but he said that I'm free to do all things, once in 1 Corinthians 6 and once in 10. Of course, all things doesn't mean to sin, though. He means all things that you're free to do, you're free to do. And that's really not just making a circle in the statement because some people don't realize how free they really are. But that doesn't mean that you always use your freedom. We haven't even covered the question of Sunday yet. But let's just hypothetically assume for a moment, and remember it's only that, that the Bible teaches that you're free 
to mow your lawn uh, Sunday afternoon, and after you finish, go to work down at the tire store where you work. Let's assume that you're free to do that. Well, then not only do you have that to consider, but you have thoughts of what are my neighbors going to think. They work on Sunday too. They mow their lawn on Sunday too. Maybe is there something else to consider here <clears throat> about bringing reproach upon Christianity and myself? Because these people can't see that there's any distinction between themselves and we who say that we are believers, that we are Christians. Now, you can never make whether you can or can't do something on Sunday into a law because the New Testament doesn't. The Old Testament does, but we're free from the law. That's one of the things we're free from. The Old Testament does, but not the New. simply doesn't say. But it lays forth these principles of rest on a certain day. It lays forth these principles of gathering together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It lays forth these principles of Christian liberty. And you have to think of these. You have to know them before you can think of them. And you have to use these to make distinctions what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. Not that you don't have the liberty and the right to do that, but sometimes you use your liberty to restrict yourself. That's not legalism, that's liberty, to be able to have the right to do something and choose not to do it. So that covers two areas. It covers under our liberty not to harm others. It covers those that are in the church, and it cover, <coughs> covers those outside. So we've said that liberty sets us free from Satan, sin, self, the law, were the points we covered, and we summed it up with all things. But love still binds us to God and to our fellow man. So turn over to 1 Corinthians 9 in two very crucial passages. One here and one in chapter 10, Paul sums up what we've been saying with regard to harming others. So we're going to sum this up before moving on. Hopefully we'll have enough time to finish all of liberty up this morning and we'll be to a new principle next week. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 22, <clears throat> he's summing up what he said in chapters 8 and 9 thus far about our liberty in harming others. And, well, I'll have to be honest with you. At one time, I didn't like these verses too much because I was real legalistic, real middle of the road, won't flinch one way or the other. And it seemed like that Paul, and I always had this passage brought to me by denominational people that Paul seemed to kind of just kind of be free and either go this way or that way depending on what the circumstances were. And that's exactly what he's doing depending on what the circumstances were. They didn't understand what they were saying by using these verses, and I certainly didn't. But I can appreciate them a lot more now. I guess you have to get maturity, some degree of maturity in you before you can appreciate verses like this. But I, at one time, was a very strong legalist in areas. I was just, it had to be this way, no questions about it. And, and you kind of look down on anyone else who didn't, didn't do it exactly the way that you did it. And if you're like that, you're a legalist, and you're not mature, and you're not free. And you're not one of the strong ones, that's for sure. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a slave unto all of them. How can you be making yourself a slave unto all if you're so high and mighty you look down on everyone else? Well, you can't. A slave looks up to his master. And he did it for a purpose, that I might gain the more. Now, some people misuse this. Say, the reason I go to bars is so I can win people to the Lord. I always have heard that from people. For some reason, it's always bars. And I guess they like to go drink. That's really the reason that they go there. But I'm just going, you know, I've made myself all things to all men so that I can gain all these people and I'll become a clown if I need to, the class clown, or join a traveling circus or something to get the lines converted. You know, stupid, ignorant things that Paul has never... Paul stayed firm in his convictions, but when a case arose like circumcision, it depended on the circumstances. He could go either way. It depended on the circumstances. 
Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain those that are under the law. To those that are without the law as without the law, that I might gain those that are without the law. He's just you're like a chameleon turning colors, depending on who he's around. <laughs> to the weak, I became weak. It's exactly what we've been teaching. If someone can't eat meat, then you can't eat meat. And you don't put some test before them to see if you can get them to stumble or something. Or you don't use that as an argument to prove how you're better than they are. Paul says, to the weak, I become weak then. If they can't eat that food, then whenever I'm around them, I'm weak just like they are weak. Remember all the distinctions that we've made. I've never heard anyone make these distinctions, though, because when I say that without the distinctions, then you end up with a watered-down form of Christianity. You end up just loving everyone. You end up with this false love movement out there, just loving everyone. Distinctions have to be made. Some things you cannot be weak about. See, you've got to interpret this not in light of how people interpret it, but in light of the context here. In some things, Paul is not weak. When it comes to the doctrine of Christ, the Judaizers, he didn't say, well, I'm going to be weak with you guys. We need faith in Christ and the law of Moses. No, he's not going to do that. He says there's no compromise. Galatians 1, if someone comes and preaches this faith and works, then it's a different gospel. It's another gospel, and let that man be accursed. Now, I don't find him saying, well, I'm going to be weak. Only in these areas we've talked about. Eating goodies from the holidays, that's an area where you could be weak or strong depending on who you're around. When I first came into the truth about the holidays, man, I thought the devil was, well, Santa Claus. I thought that's the devil. And to eat a Christmas cookie would defile your conscience because it identifies you too much with this pagan holiday and pagan feast. But now I can eat them. They taste good. They're sweet. I'm glad I can eat them now. <laughs> and so if I'm out at a store and, and no one knows me in that store, and they've got a little tray over there serving up Kool-Aid and Christmas cookies, I'll go grab a few of them. Then. Not if someone knows me now, maybe, because maybe that would affect their comprehension of my beliefs in Christianity. But especially whenever I'm traveling in another state, no one knows you, you can do pretty much as you please then within your Christian confines zone. If they have Christian, I mean, if they have Christmas cookies there, then they're Christian cookies as far as I'm concerned. Whatever I eat is Christian because everything I do is supposed to be a Christian thing that I'm doing. So it bothers me not at all. But you have a weak brother with you, and you say, look at that occult stuff over there. <laughs> And he just says, that's right. Praise God, we're delivered. <laughs> and you say, praise God, we have the truth about all of this occult demonism. That's exactly what you do. And you encourage him because he's just come out of that. You don't want to make him go back into that, you see. Just what Paul is teaching. They just come out of idolatry. Now, don't eat meat offered to idols. You're going to take them right back into that. So you agree with him. To the weak, you're weak. Only in certain areas. Only in certain areas. And you should be taught enough now, if you'll sit down and think, you'll know when you come to the area, is can this be a weak area for me? Or is it doctrine from the Word of God? Then there's no compromise. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. How do you like that? That means this weak one can't stay weak forever. Paul says, I'm going to become like he is so that he eventually will become like I am. Isn't that what he's saying? Then that is a good proof text to tell us that we're not going to have the same weak person in the church forever. We can have weak people, but not the same one. We're all weak whenever we begin, but we have to grow beyond that. He said, I've got a purpose. I, I want to gain that one. I want to gain him to my strength so that he sees that a cookie is a cookie is a cookie is a cookie. An Easter bunny is an Easter bunny is an Easter bunny. Chocolate, it can have anything in it. You're not eating a demon when you bite into that. There's not a demon hiding inside of it. If you're strong, only the strong ones really recognize that. And I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Paul was one who said, let's follow after those things that make for peace. He said, I become all things to all men, that if by all means I might save them. Then in the next chapter, the last two verses. The last two verses. 
He's summing up all that he and we have been saying about liberty and things with regard to our refraining from harming others. Paul said, give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the assembly of God. That means everyone, saved and lost, Jew and Gentile. He said, give no offense, put no stumbling block, cause no approach from any quarters upon yourself for the Christian message. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. For the continuation... Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. At one time, I didn't like those verses because I thought they were too weak. And you probably thought the same thing. If you were, if you were ever really into this walk, I mean wanting everything, people who've never been like that, then they like verses like this. They've always liked them. <laughs> But if you've ever been into it where you wanted every jot and tittle to be right in your life and it was going to be this way and you wouldn't compromise and wouldn't even think and look down on everyone else around you, then no, 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 you don't like these verses here. Paul says, I'm trying to please everyone, trying to get the whole world saved. You're kind of glad that you're the only one saved and that God elected you and had grace on you and no one else is going to see this. Paul said, it's my desire that everyone see the same things I see. At one time, I didn't have that. I don't know if you can be honest enough to say that, but I can. At one time, I didn't have that. I didn't have that desire to see all people say that. I was just glad I had it, and I was only concerned about myself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's as unscriptural a belief and practice as you could find anywhere in the New Testament, to be only concerned about yourself. That's the one thing has to die, his self. <laughs> he said, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. And if I, this has probably been the most parenthetical teachings I've ever done, because I always have to say, remember only in certain areas. Because I get a picture, a mental picture in my mind of how some people misinterpret this and end up going over to their next door neighbors, getting on a long chair, having a barbecue with them, playing volleyball, just chatting, chewing the bowl with them. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That is not what we're talking about. You need to live a separate and distinct life. Remember, the same apostle who wrote this wrote chapter 6 of the next epistle. And he said, have no fellowship with unbelievers. What fellowship has light with darkness? We're supposed to lead a pure, clean life. But we're peaceable people. When we come into contact with these other people, our concern is for them. I'm not going to be like some misinterpret this and spend my whole life trying to get people in the slums one to the Lord. He said, don't have anything to do with the unbeliever out there until by accident you come into contact with them, you work with them, you live with them, and then live a peaceful life. Don't compromise the word, but don't bring reproach onto Christianity by unbeliever or cause your brother to stumble. Okay, I want to say one final thing, or one final area. It won't be just a statement. It'll be a lot of statements. The positive side of liberty. We said that there were reasons for liberty negatively stated. We have liberty not to sin. We have liberty not to harm others. Positively stated. But what's the purpose? We said those were purposes of liberty negatively stated. Positively. The purpose of our liberty is so that we can voluntarily glorify and honor God. The doctrine of forgiveness may not be used by the Christian as an excuse for laxity or sin. Well, God will forgive me. Well, he will. But we're not talking about forgiveness. We're talking about sin. Sin comes first. Forgiveness comes next. You want to talk about the doctrine of forgiveness, that's fine. But let's start with sin. Then we won't have to talk about the doctrine of forgiveness. There's no way that a person can sin and glorify God at the same time. So you cannot use your liberty as license and at the same time glorify God. This perfect law of liberty is the law of love. 1 Timothy 1.5 It 
The end of the commandment is love, love toward others and love toward God. Now, I copied this down somewhere, I couldn't find where, but another way of summing these things up. We've given you many different ways of summing them up concerning the liberty that we have. And that is, in the first place, we cannot use weak excuses for abstinence, even when we're walking in an attempt to glorify God. We cannot use weak excuses for abstinence but neither can we use bad reasons for indulgence. Which could be A, for the weak soul, and B, for the strong one who carries it a step too far. You see, the weak fella uses bad, weak excuses for his abstinence. Well, this meat was offered to an idol. Well, that's a weak excuse why you're abstaining. And someone else has a bad reason for indulgence. I'm free in Christ. I can do anything I want to do. So you have to be on guard, in other words, for these two things, weak excuses for abstinence and bad reasons for indulgence. It's very easy to exchange your liberty for slavery. And you do that through the process of sin. When you sin, you've exchanged the liberty. You're never at liberty to sin. When you do sin... You've exchanged your liberty for slavery. And some people still think that's liberty. Paul deals with that in chapter 6 of Romans. So to use non-Christian slavery or Christian liberty to sin is to exclude yourself from the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19a. To use non-Christian slavery, they can't help but sin. Or Christian liberty, that is, an excess of it, a misapplication of it. Well, I'm free in Christ. Didn't he say I can do all things in 1 Corinthians 6.12? To use either is to exclude oneself from the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.19a. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, he names them, skipping now to 21b, and those that do such works shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, how do you like that? Regardless of whether your excuse was your non-Christian slavery, I couldn't help myself, or your Christian liberty, I could, and I chose to do that because I'm free. Regardless of what excuses used, those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A Christian's purpose in his liberty is to live a life that honors God and to live a life that glorifies Him. You can't do that as a non-Christian. You do not have the freedom to stop sinning, as we have said so many times. So the purpose of our liberty is to free us from slavery to sin and free us to slavery to Jesus Christ. And this is more than just outward deeds. This covers all sinful motives and attitudes. 1 Peter 2.16 The purpose of our liberty is to free you from slavery to sin to slavery to Jesus Christ to glorify God in your holiness. In these gray areas, all you have to do is ask yourself what will glorify God? What will glorify God? And then you're free to do that. 1 Peter 2.16 As free, but not using our liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, use it to sin, but as the slaves of God. Use my liberty to be free from the slavery to sin and to make myself or to have myself made into a slave to Jesus Christ. So here are three questions you can ask yourself about the gray areas that arise in your life. We'll give them to you in the order that we've discussed them. Number one, will it cause my brother to stumble? Well, I'm on an island by myself, okay? That question doesn't apply. Number two, will it bring reproach from an unbeliever? 
a reproach upon me or upon my Lord or upon my church or upon my religious convictions. And number three, and most importantly, will it glorify my Father in heaven? When we get into some of the specific areas, we'll show you more how it actually can be a glorification of God, but not a glorification in as outward and positive sense as you're lifting up your hands and your voice and praising him in new tongues or something. But it certainly can't be something that doesn't bring glory to him. So, Romans 14 now. Romans 14. You see here in verse 6, we're in a chapter on causing others to stumble, but the glory of God is also brought forth. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. See, there's glory for God. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and he giveth God thanks. The glory of God is still brought forth, even in a chapter where almost all of the verses are dealing with the problem of causing another brother in the local body to stumble. Colossians 3 17. Colossians 3 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, how could you sin in Jesus' name? Mm-hmm. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. It's a positive side of the question of the exercise of your Christian liberty say, well, what about in these passages that we've been talking about? Well, he's summing it up with that way, and it's found there, 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. It's found here. That's where it's repeated. You'd, have to, you'd expect that you'd have to find uh, a reference like what we find in 10.31, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And we do find it. That's why I'm drawing this out of these chapters as the positive side of the principle of Christian liberty. Whether you eat, whether you drink, that's basically what he's been talking about, or whatever you do, in any area, in every area, all your life long as a Christian, then do it all to the glory of God. Now, in conclusion, let me say a few more things about strong brothers and weak brothers, and we maybe will finish in a short time then this morning. I could have elaborated more, but... I feel like I repeat too much because we've elaborated on that so often before. Some of you may feel like you're strong out there. So here are two pitfalls to watch out for if you think you're a strong brother or sister. And you've probably fallen into these before. We're not immune to these automatically. And I guess, well, if you're really strong then you've probably fallen into this first one. And that is, be careful of overly reacting to the weakness or to the immaturity of a weak brother so that your overreaction carries you into questionable or objectionable objectionable areas. You can become so distraught over some weak brother's immaturity that working the gears inside you or working in such a way you say, well, I'll show them a thing or two. Just watch what I can do. And then because of your overreaction, you go too far and you actually sin in your strength. That is a pitfall. Now, if you're not strong, then maybe you can't appreciate what I'm saying. I can appreciate that. You just become so disgusted with someone else's weakness or their immaturity then you overreact against that. <clears throat> when you overreact, you go beyond the limits that you should go. And you get into areas where you've sinned. And you're weak just like they are when you do that. So that's something I don't think that I've mentioned before. The second one I have, it's still a pitfall, but 
That's one I haven't mentioned before. Be careful of overreacting. And this only applies to people who are strong, who are really the ones wanting to go all the way. And sometimes you can pick up that mentality. You become so disgusted with other weak people around you, you go too far in your own life. Trying, you're not trying outwardly, or you're not thinking, I'm going to prove this to someone, but that's what happens in the back of your mind. You're trying to prove a point. I'm strong, and I cannot believe this person is so weak. And you go too far. Then secondly, another pitfall is for the strong individual to exercise their liberty in such a way that it leads the weaker one into sin, thus defiling his conscience. Sin to him, not sin to the stronger one, such as eating meat offered to idols. I just heard someone say, not here, but somewhere else not long ago, Oh, now, don't give us any of this business that something could be sin for one person and not sin for another. What's wrong is wrong to all of us. That's not a true statement. Paul shows what can be sin for one is not necessarily sin for someone else. Eating meat offered to idols will become a sin for a weak brother because it defiles his conscience, and we even read there that he could perish, the one for whom Christ died. That's pretty strong language in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So you would exercise your liberty like doing these things, like eating the meat, like doing these various um, particular things that we've mentioned. You could do that in front of a weak brother. This is the pitfall to avoid in exercising your Christian liberty because it could lead him to follow you and do what you did, and he's not ready to do that. And when he does, then it defiles his conscience. Two pitfalls. The scriptures teach that the church is always going to have both weak and strong members in it. Romans 14 is all about that. Romans 15 starts off that way. Again, those of us, when we first got into this, kind of didn't like to recognize these facts. And they are facts. There's nothing you can do with facts but accept them. The church of Jesus Christ will always be made up of both weak and strong brothers and sisters. Do you believe that? You're quiet. Do you believe that? Well, that's what the Bible teaches. It'll always be made up. I mean, we could wish it would be some other way, but wishing and facts are two different things in this area. It's always going to be made up of the weak and the strong one. Romans 15, we then that are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak. Why didn't he just say, well, bless God. Why don't you get faith in your heart? Get in the word of God, you weak people. Stop coming to church until you are strong. Your approach on the church and Christianity. <laughs> Paul doesn't teach that way. Paul doesn't teach that way. All of these legalisms that people have invented. I think we started off way back in the beginning here in talking about liberty that uh, fundamentalism is known as that aspect of Christianity that's a negative, can't do aspect i don't wear makeup i don't go to the movies i don't watch tv uh, i don't do this i don't do that. It's always i don't don't presented with the attitude that if you keep your nose clean you'll be pleasing to god that's really what it amounts to if you'll live a good life and don't do certain things you'll be pleasing to god we've said before that the lost man can abstain from things like that which doesn't prove anything at all and i can say this which is really what we've been saying all along it comes down to these teachings that when you find a church, when you find a group, when you find a Christian person who is a negatively oriented person, it's always negativism from them, then that's the same bondage of legalism we've been talking about here that characterizes fundamentalism out there, the non-charismatic element of fundamentalism. It characterizes some parts of the charismatic movement where it's always negative, 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 negative. And when you find that, that's a false presentation. At that point, it's not a Christian church. The church is positive. We saw that. Well, we saw that, remember, here in chapter 14, verse 17. We preached a lot on this. The kingdom of God's not in TVs or magazines, but it's in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. We taught on that. When you don't do that, you're not teaching and living in line with the New Testament. We that are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak. He doesn't say here there shouldn't be any weak ones. 
And some people would like to have it that way. You know, this is the church of Jesus Christ. Well, it was at Rome, too. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Then over in Galatians 6 and verse 1, we have the same teaching. The church over here in Asia Minor had weak people and strong people. And Paul didn't say there's anything wrong with having weak people there. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, you can see that this is the strong, weak contrast here in this verse, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, which is the perfect law of liberty, which is the law of love, by bearing one another's burdens. However, after saying that, then let me say this. Although the church, our church, this church, any true church, is always going to be made up of both strong and weak people, the weak people are never the same ones from year to year. As long as you know that, then really you have no problem with this strong and weak business. I have no problem with that. only problem I would have is that we have the weak people, the same ones, year after year after year. Never teaches that. Never teaches that. You know what's the whole New Testament about, about growing up, growing up, growing up. And how can you grow up to some place if you never, if you, if you never were weak sometime in the past in your life? You've got to grow from somewhere to somewhere. You had to be weak at one time in your life in order to grow from that. But the weak ones can never stay the same weak ones year after year after year. We have no problems in this church having weak people in. Weak people that are members, weak people that are in good fellowship with the church, as long as they don't stay weak, as long as they grow. The church must never fight or divide over these questions of liberty or conscience. I know of one that's doing just that. Maybe this morning. Fighting and dividing over questions of liberty and conscience. But we are to live in love and peace eternally with one another. Now that is a major doctrine of the New Testament with regard to the composition of the church. The other things that deal with other things. The atonement's not a church doctrine, that's for you personally. But we would have no need of Christian liberty and all these teachings if you were an island unto yourself. You can have atonement. You can have some of these other major doctrines all by yourself. But I'm saying this doctrine of Christian liberty is a major, is one of the major doctrines. Maybe, maybe it is the major doctrine. I just haven't sat down and thought of all of them. That relates to the church, her operation, her composition, her administration, and the functions that she has. Is this doctrine of Christian liberty. You know, they weren't perfect in New Testament days. They're always fighting in the churches over little petty things. We looked at one example, I believe, in Philippians 4. Paul wrote to two women. He said, be of the same mind in the Lord. Must have meant what they were arguing about. We we're not told, by the way, but was not anything significant. He said, be of the same mind in the Lord. Why does he write all that? Philippians 2, he said, you should live your life without murmurings and without disputings. Generally, you're murmuring and disputing over these little icks and isms that we all have personally. We're not fighting over the doctrine of the atonement. Have we fought over that? No. What have we fought, in, fought over in this church? These little things I've mentioned about cookies and toys and Sunday and meats and things like that. I know what I'm talking about. The Bible teaches it. We don't fight over the major things. We fight in the areas of liberty. We have fought. Let's make a good confession. We shouldn't fight anymore once we know this. Fights have arisen over whether you put powder on a baby's bottom or not. Areas of quick Christian liberty. So that's why I'm saying if it's not the, it's one of the top areas that we have to all understand to be a functioning good member of this church or any church. And you ought to know this now from all of these teachings. 
And they're going to be new and different areas come up. We can't foresee the future and what new thing is going to happen or new thing is going to come up. But principles never change. Principles never change. Only the objects under discussion change. Now we're going to switch to a new topic. But the principle is still valid there. You have to make the distinctions that are correct. You have to, regardless of anything, the Bible says love is the most important thing. So even if you can't come to agreement on everything, that's not what's important. What's important, the greatest of these, Paul said, is love. We have to live in love and peace with one another. Do you think that you've changed in that area, let's say, in the last year? Amen. You've gotten to the place that you're easier to get along with. You're not so hard-headed, hard-nosed, dogmatic about every little thing. That you can live in peace and not go home condemning in your mind someone else who does something a little differently than you do. I hope you've gotten to that place. These are tapes to hear again, notes to go over again. It's in the Bible, but you're, you, you would not have gotten that just in reading 8, 9, and 10 in 1 Corinthians, though. Not these principles and not the way that we're taught to apply them. But it's all there. You can see that now. They had certain things in that day. You know, meat offered to idols. I told you before, we don't have that problem now. So you see, the problems change, but the principles are always the same. Now we have other things. Now we have, you know, is it all right to, uh, we gave you this example, when you're looking for new station on the radio in the car to turn over to a rock and roll station. Some people couldn't do that. Just couldn't. That'd be wrong for them. That hear that beat and start tapping their foot. For me, I never was caught up into all the music. For me, it'd be fine. It's not going to bother me. I mean, it could if you listen to it too much. There is a satanic beat. There's no doubt about that. That can even affect the strong ones. But you have the liberty to turn there and pause 10 seconds to see if it's going to come news on after that or the weather or something. But a weak one, you don't want to do that with a weak one. And the same is true with all of these other areas. The same could be true with sodomite shoes. Same thing. Well, our problem is people have tried to insist that that be a doctrine of the church. Then we said, you're a false brethren. And then you see, maybe I can even make it a little plainer than that, although we've said as much before. If you've got someone who's had a problem because they were a homosexual with that certain type of shoe, and I just can hardly picture that, but you do not want to wear shoes like that around a person like that. But you know what? And Paul does it. Whenever you find someone taking some little petty thing and it's wrong and trying to make a doctrine out of it, he tries to make that as noticeable as possible. So it would almost be your obligation, put your sodomite shoes on, get your prostitute purse, do whatever you have to do to shock them into reality of what's going on. You see, you don't do that. You don't do that against anyone until it comes to a case like this. Someone insisting their way be made true. And you show them how you can wear shoes like that, wear a purse like that, and speak in tongues and praise God at the same time. You have to show them that. That is someone else, you don't do that. Maybe you didn't know that you've got the liberty. And Paul takes it. He just comes right out. Anytime someone's trying to bind him with something, then he goes overboard showing how I don't have to be bound by that at all. And I refuse to be bound by that. If you want to suggest it, then I probably won't contradict you. won't say anything about it. But if you want to make a doctrine out of that, then I'm going to make a doctrine against that. And just as strong as you preach yours, I'm going to preach mine. That's what he does in the Word of God.